Just a little bit of a heads up. You are free to move your body when a choir is singing. Okay, church? Come on. I mean, I see some of you are all like, yes, he did. And some of you are just like, is this over yet? I mean, he did. Yes, he did heal me. Yes, he did. Okay, that's good. Can we, when's the guy, the bald guy going to come talk right now? I just want to stand here. You guys are free to move. I mean, some of you, like, here's the deal. Like, some of you don't like to move. You don't like to be, I don't like to be told what to do. That's what some of you feel like. Okay, here's the thing. You don't got to. Just do this. <laughs> Super simple. I'm, you'll feel so much better inside if you just move with the music. Listen, I'm not a dancer. Ask my kids. I try. They make funny videos of me, but I'm not. But I think you guys will love it. So here's the deal. They're going to come up again. Not right now. Boring, bald guy's going to talk right now. But when I'm done, then they're going to come back up. And just feel free to get into the music a little bit, okay? My kids are watching this and they're laughing at me right now, but that's okay. Isn't it a joy to have something like the choir to get involved in? Can we just give them another hand of applause? They have worked, they have worked tirelessly. Also, I want to apologize. I do realize we're running out of some seats for you all uh, next week, and we'll be sure to make sure that there's more seating back there. I know some of you are like, where do I sit? But find a place, squish in if you can, and then uh, we promise next week we will have more seats available. This morning, I am challenged by the text that I have to work through. Now, you need to understand, I spent a lot of time in prayer for you as a, as a church and for our community each and every time I'm deciding what we should talk about um, or what my role is, is leading through scripture. And I get different senses or different ideas, but I, I really want to listen to say, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to use my voice for? Because no one needs to hear Matt's opinions. We want to hear your word. And so I do that. And then typically it settles in my spirit. I make the decision, okay, this is the way to go. I chat with Bill and other friends. And we kind of put a schedule together. And I'll, and I'll plot out, you know, two, three, or maybe the whole series out in advance, not knowing what might happen in culture when it's time to talk about those different passages. What I've found is in the last couple years, God's goodness to us and his leading us through scripture has fit so appropriately with what's been going on in culture. I have not decided what to speak on based on culture because I don't want to do that. I want to decide what does God want us to hear and then he knows what's coming up in culture. And so this morning, I did not adjust this series schedule that was made weeks ago to what's been going on in Russia and Ukraine, or the upheaval that's stirring right now, in particular with political powers and war occurring. But as God would have it, this morning, we're gonna be talking about two of Jesus' most radical ideas when it comes to how we treat our enemies. I did not plan that, this is how God said it. So here's the deal. I would ask for you to extend grace towards me this morning. And I'm going to do my best to keep it on point with what Jesus is saying. Keep my opinions back so that we can all be equally offended by what Jesus is saying this morning. <laughs> because I don't know about you, but when I read the word of God, it offends my heart continually. Because he likes to do things different than the way I like them to be done. And especially when it comes to how to handle conflict or how to handle war, or how to defend those, those that are getting trapped in injustice, or what to do to advance in warfare, to create peace, all those things. I have some pretty good ideas on that. J just so you know, let me put it to you like this, just so you know, before we get into this, I lean more towards Cobra Kai than Miyagi-Do, okay? <laughs> so if you know much about what happens, with, if you've seen Karate Kid at all, okay? Like, I watch it, I appreciate LaRusso, I mean, he's kind of a skinny, geeky kid. I appreciate him, but I kind of was like the Cobra Kai guy. Like, I, I like, like, just punch him in the mix, strike first. You know, like, I, 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 I kind of lean in that direction. You need to know that about me. So when I read some of Jesus' teachings, I'm like, oh, Lord, this is offending me. But that's the goodness of God to allow us to be offended, because when we are offended, it forces us to look at a different way of doing things. And after all, this series is called A Better Way to Be Human. It's Jesus' manifesto to say, when you follow me, here's the better way 
to live in the world. And he doesn't make it where it's so out there. He brings it right close to home as we've been reading about things like marriage and oaths and divorce and the attitude of your heart. Jesus got very specific with people. And this morning, he's gonna get very specific and introduce two of his most radical ideas, nonviolent resistance and enemy love. And this is, I think, appropriate because it's, stirred in us is what we're seeing in the news. And Jesus would have something to say to us about how we handle ourselves in conflict. Now, one thing that's guaranteed for all of our lives is at some point we're gonna deal with conflict. And how we deal with conflict is what Jesus wants to talk about. Now, if you have any kids, those of you that do have kids, if you can think back to when they're younger, like single digits or early double digits. Uh, My kids currently right now are 11 and 10. Now, what I get to observe with my children is kind of like the OG human heart before it grows older. You know, it's kind kind of like what's in there in the very beginning of humans. And it's interesting because my kids in conflict kind of come up with their own justice system. And it kind of works like this. My son, not for any reason at all, simply slides his leg over to my daughter's side of the vehicle, (laughs) which typically results in a little chirp at first. But if that leg doesn't get moved, it's evolved into a scratch, then a pinch, and there's a little bit of yelling back and forth, and then ultimately, bigger arms win as my daughter leans over and will clock my son if need be. Okay, open hand, open, open hand, not close hand, open hand. Now, when you watch that, you go, man, what what is it about the human condition that when you've been wronged, you feel the need to one up the wrong back? And then they feel the need to one up the wrong back from that. And even though we might have sayings like eye for eye or tooth for tooth, as Jesus is going to mention to us here, we know that ultimately we don't like to keep to that. We desire to one up our aggressor. Because as we've learned, when people retaliate, it's never equal. It's always more. And in a sense, when you think about it, when there's violence, it rarely ends well. It typically feeds itself and only gets worse. In Mark Twain's writings, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, there's one saying that there's one part of the story that goes like this. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him. Then the other brothers on both sides go for one another. Then the cousins chip in and by and by the end, everyone is killed off and there ain't no more feud. (laughs) Now we laugh, but isn't that kind of true? That's kind of where it ends up. Well, Jesus understands that people have conflict. And in particular, at the time of Jesus, There was massive political conflict that was really touching the lives of everyday Jews. We know that Jesus, at this time, the passage we're reading, Jesus is actually up on a hill, a hill that potential other revolutionaries have been up on before. And he's giving his manifesto. And what you need to understand is, historically, 70 years before this moment, Rome had invaded Israel. They had come in and taken power and kind of put some puppets in place to lead Israel. And then they began to oppress Israel. And one of the ways they did this was they placed Roman guards everywhere in every small town and village. They were kind of militarized zones, if you will. Well, not only did they place these guards there, but the guards then kind of began taking upon themselves to take the land from the people of Israel. Little plots of land in here and there, grandma's land or widow's land, but they would move in and go, well, you know, I'm I'm not just here to hang out. I'm here to to take some property. I want to make this my own. So they were stealing some of the Jewish people's lands. Not only that, the Romans taxed them. Not 15%, not 30%. The tax that we know about was probably between 80 and 90%, essentially taking all of their money, leaving a little bit for them to try to survive on their own. Not only that, you have famine that's happening, poor health care. And as we know, the average man only lived to be about 50 years old or so during this time in Israel's history. It was a very tough time, and in part was because of the oppression of the Roman people. So people began to react. In particular, young men created a couple different groups. One of the groups is known as the Zealots, carrying the zeal of Phineas in the Old Testament. And they would try to um, have skirmishes and battles with the Romans in different areas where they could try to, try to overthrow some of their oppression. The other group of young men were known as the Sicarii. 
And the Sicarii were kind of the first official group of assassins, actually started during the time of Jesus in Israel. And the Sicarii were known for carrying these small little blades. And in the public squares, they would sneak up behind the Roman guards and slit their throats and hide back into the crowds. People were trying to create a way forward. They're trying to create a way to, to remove the oppression that was upon them. And then there's this guy named Jesus, who it seemed to be, he was trying to create a way too, because he kept talking about this, this kingdom, this new kingdom. And then not only that, he was like making lame legs walk and blind eyes see and casting out demons. And so people wanted to come hear what he had to say. And so maybe you yourself as a young man and young woman are kind of gathered on this hillside and everything Jesus has said up to this point kind of makes sense. Great. Oh, attitudes in my heart make sense. You know, make, okay, you know, marriage, got it. Oaths, got it. And then Jesus introduced his two most radical ideas. An idea that would so radically affect a generation, would so radically affect them, it would either offend them or motivate them. There would be no middle ground. There there would be no way to hear Jesus and what he's about to say and go, ah, he's kind of a good guy. You would either be for what he's saying or you'd be like, man, I am not standing with him. And and we saw that at the end of Jesus' life. There were those who were for him and then those who actually crucified him. So Jesus is going to, say some things that we're going to talk about this morning. And I'm not going to have time to go in depth on this. Uh, I will only have so much time that's allotted to me on this Sunday morning. So what I'd ask you to do is please go to our podcast, subscribe, download. During this week, I will be releasing a follow-up episode where I will not talk about anything I shared this morning, but all the stuff I couldn't share because of time. So I'm going to skip some things around so you can at least get the, the gist of what Jesus is saying. Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 38. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, Carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Now, verse 39 says something that's striking right off the bat. It says, do not resist an evil person. Well, is that pacifism? Jesus, are you saying that if someone's evil, that I'm just supposed to roll over and do whatever they say? That's not actually what he's saying. The Greek word that's used for resist here is antistani. And antistani means specifically resisting with violence. It's the idea not of resisting, it's the idea of Cobra Kai getting the first punch in as soon as you can. It's an idea of of a vengeful resisting, not resisting. Now, we know that because as you begin to read and you look at culture, the things that he's about to say, Clearly, Jesus is saying there is a resistance that's supposed to happen, but it's not meant to be violent. For instance, the first one he says is, when someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Now, if you're standing in somebody and you're meant to hit their right cheek, that right cheek is going to be on that side. And a culture that's primarily going to use their right hand to hit somebody, how do you hit that person's right cheek? backhandedly. If you're standing in front of someone and you go to slap them, you're going to hit which cheek? The left cheek. In Israel, at that time, in the ancient world, the most insulting thing you could do to somebody, the way to steal their dignity and speak down to them was to backhand somebody. Not just between men, but it would happen between women, men to women, and even men to their slaves. It was not a matter of just striking out of anger, like I want to fist fight you. The idea was I will slap you. I will slap the dignity right out of you. I'm going to show you, you are less than I am. So Jesus says, when that happens, arm bar him and make him tap out. Nope, that's not what Jesus says. (laughs) My Jesus says that, but not this one says that. Jesus says, when they slap in the cheek, run away. That's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say fight. 
He doesn't say flight. What does he say? He says, take the hit, stand up, step in and go, you want to hit the other side now? What he's saying is, you're not to hit him and you're not to run away, but you're meant to absorb the evil and absorb the oppression he's doing. Take back your dignity by saying, that slap is not going to steal my dignity. And in doing that, in doing that, in doing that, the absorbing of this and offering that cheek, what you're doing is you're then exposing the injustice of what's actually going to occur. Now, this makes sense as we go through the next examples. The next example that Jesus gives is if you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat. In the ancient world, the, the everyday Middle Eastern man had a shirt, uh, some kind of covering that was close to his chest, and then he also wore a coat. The shirt was to keep him warm, close to his chest, but the coat was also not just to keep him warm, it was protection, and it was also the very thing that men used to sleep with at night. In fact, if you look at some of the old laws back then, you'll find there were laws about what you could do to somebody in regards to their coat, because their coat was kind of like their security, their ability to, to protect themselves. And so Jesus is saying, when you go to court, you get sued, and the injustice of whatever suit that happens there feels like they ripped out the inside of your coat and took your shirt. Don't grab the stool you're sitting on and chuck it at the judge, but also don't walk away crying and bitter as the victim. He says, stand there, and what does he say? Give your coat as well. In some ways, this is a humorous way of Jesus saying, if they take your shirt, Give him your coat. What he's, what he's saying is, if they take your shirt, take everything off and stand there naked in front of them. Let them know what they just did to you. It's a resistance and acknowledging this is what you've done to me, giving them the chance to be exposed for the injustice they caused you. Again, this resistance is nonviolent, but it is still resistance. Lastly, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it too. The Roman guard was given permission that at any time that they desired and in way to humiliate kind of the men in Israel, that at any time that they desired, if they were walking by a man and desired that they didn't want to carry their gear anymore, they could demand that Jewish man to come alongside them and carry their gear, but for only up to a mile. I don't know the exact measurement, but that's in the measurement in what we would know today here in America. So that means that if you were a man running around trying to get groceries for your wife or get things ready for dinner, they're probably doing that. Or if you were a man trying to get home on time for something, or you're just a man walking by with your friends and you happen to make eye contact or happen to be called out. This is essentially what happened to Simon when he was called, Simon the Cyrene, when he was called to come and carry the cross of Jesus, kind of a humiliating act in some degree. They could reach out to you and say, hey, you, so-and-so, come and carry my gear. It was extremely humiliating because you had to stop whatever you're doing, instantly give up your dignity, walk over to your oppressor and carry the very gear that he was using to oppress you with for up to a mile. Well, Matt's reaction would be, pick up that gear, throw it at him, say, carry your own gear and take off running. Or maybe someone else's reaction wouldn't be to fight. It maybe it would be just to take it and be quiet and be victimized by it and be saddened by it. Or Jesus, in this better way to be human, this middle way, this third way, this both and more way, would say, pick up the armor, stand up straight, walk it a mile, and then take your dignity back by walking it another mile. And maybe when you walk it that second mile, you'll get a chance to talk to that guard because he's going to be put off by that. Wait, you're, you're going to willingly keep carrying? Who are you? Why would you willingly keep carrying my gear? You want to know my name? You want to know why, why I'm here? Jesus gives this picture of not pacifism. He doesn't give this picture of strength and action and retaliating and vengeance. He gives this picture of keeping your identity as a son and daughter of God, absorbing whatever wrongdoing is coming, and then standing in that type of resistance, exposing the evil that's happening between two parties. Jesus says this is the better way to be human, but this is the more radical way to be human. 
Well, if we stop there, that'd be cool. Like, I'm good. Thanks, Jesus. Good to go. Let's move on. But of course, Jesus, as always, goes another step even deeper. He continues in verse 43. He says, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, just to be clear, there is no law anywhere in scripture that says that. Like oftentimes, Jesus in his teaching would grab kind of cultural slang. And the best we can tell is that this might have been a very common idiom that was being used, kind of in jest, but also kind of serious. So he's saying, calling it out. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way you'll be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. I will specifically talk about that verse 48 in this week's podcast. Love your enemies. Now, we have to be fair to the text in that the American language is very limited in how we um, come up with our vocabulary. We use the term love for a a widespread of different kinds of love. Uh, I could use the term love when it comes to talking about dark chocolate peanut butter cups from Trader Joe's. Like a deep affection and love for that little tiny candy. I, I love it. But, but while I love it, of course, I love our family pet a bit more. Our family pet, we actually have, if you, didn't, you probably don't know this, we have a little white bunny with blue eyes. Cute little white bunny. I love that bunny, but if it was an apocalypse and we had nothing to eat, bunny's the first one to go, okay? Just, I'm just being straight up here, okay? <laughs> That's how we don't have a dog. <laughs> Eating a dog wouldn't be as good. Bun, bunny over dog. Okay, you guys told you. You're offended. You're offended by me already. I'm just kidding. We would, I mean, we, anyways, let's just skip over that. <laughs> love. When I talk about loving my kids, there is a deep affection with the term loving my children, but it's different than how I love my wife. What I'm saying is that the word, the term love is used in all these different ways. We have to usually clarify it with people. What do you mean by love? Like, do you really love them that much? Well, in the Greek language, they had seven different words for different kinds of love. Eros was the erotic love. Philo was the love that was kind of given towards a friend. There was humorous love. There was playful love. And then there was this love that was kind of like a, A love that was the kind of love you just chose to have even if you didn't feel like it. The Greek word for that was agape. Matthew, when recording the teaching of Jesus here, uses that word for when he says, love your enemies. And what Jesus is saying in Matthew's remembering is Jesus is saying, it may never feel good to love your enemies. You might not find anything that you even have in common with your enemies. Your enemies might not even do things that, you might ever even enjoy doing, but you need to agape them. What does that mean? It's you need to choose to make the commitment to bend your will to maybe in the bending of your will to love them, you might love them into what might become their relationship to God as well. He's not saying you have to wait for it to feel right. He's acknowledging it might not ever feel right. Otherwise he would have used a different word for love. He's saying, this is the kind of love that you have to choose. Scott McKnight, who's a great New Testament scholar, put it this way. He said, love, or this kind of agape love is a rugged commitment to be with someone as someone who is for that person's good and to love them unto God's formative purpose. This idea that that I'm choosing, though they might be my enemy, to love them, to bend my will towards them in the hopes that they might find the love of my heavenly father like I found. That kind of love doesn't say you don't say anything about their evil behavior. That kind of love says you say something. That kind of love doesn't say that you accept everything about what they do is wrong and just take it and be 
complain that you're a victim. No, that kind of love steps in at the right times and appropriate moments and speaks in love. Hey, you shouldn't be doing things like this. You can confront them with the evil they're doing and still do it with agape. Jesus says that's the kind of love that you need to have towards your enemies. He says, don't forget it. That's in some ways, that as we'll read in a moment, the love that God has for you, but it's even deeper than that because we do know that God allows the sun and the rain to shine and pour down on the just and the unjust alike. That God allows, and remember, this is an agricultural society. So when they hear sun and rain, you might be thinking, well, yeah, I hope he brings some sun down on my enemy, like the sun burning, scorching, kind of killing, dehydration kind of sun. He can bring all that sun he wants on my enemy. I, I, I pray God brings some rain, a little bit of excess to the point of flooding and maybe potential drowning. That sounds good for the unjust. But that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is God allows the sun and the rain, the things that create flourishing from the ground, he allows that to fall, not just on those who are fair, not just on those who are loving, not just on those who are just, but also those who perpetuate injust, maybe are hateful or would be considered the enemy. God allows that kind of rain to fall. So he says, this is what you should do. You should pray for your enemy. But Lord, Lord, how do I love my, how do I begin? He says, pray for them. Pray for them. And we all know if we've had any conflict in your life or you can think back on any conflict or conflict you're in right now, the times that you take to choose to actually bend your will and prayer for goodwill to be upon that person, you almost find that you begin to release the bitterness towards that enemy. That maybe that enemy doesn't become your friend, but maybe he at least becomes like your neighbor. That, that when you choose to, to pray for them, it, it does this shifting in your heart. He even says to go as far as, you know, you can be kind to your friends that you like, but what would it look like for you to be kind to your enemy? He doesn't say, invite them in your house, give them food, have them hang out. Let's have a whole sing kumbaya and eat fondue together. This is amazing. He's not saying that. He's saying, what would it look like for you to agape, choose to extend love while then praying and being kind to your enemy? Jesus is giving us a picture of a better way to be human. And we might say, but Matt, that is impossible. It's impossible to even imagine right now. I got prayers for Putin, all right, but none of them them look good. (laughs) It's impossible to think that I got to pray for my ex-husband or ex-wife. I mean, do you know what they did to me in court? I I can't even imagine, Lord, praying for my boss that, that... The visions I have are so grandiose of how I'd like to take him by his. Like, how do I find the motivation, Lord, to do that? Where do I find the strength inside myself to do that? How do I find the power within myself to even begin to think about turning the other cheek, giving over my coat, walking the extra mile, and loving my enemy? I think Jesus would say, Have you forgotten so easily that there was some point where you were actually one of God's enemies? Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter five. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed us his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, here, listen to this point here, church, by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice and our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Lord, 
how could I ever in myself find love for my enemies? And he would say, well, first you have to experience the way I loved you, even when you were my enemy. That, that, that I loved you even when you had nothing in your life that represented any category of the things I stood for. Jesus would say, I still came down and gave my life for you so that I would heal any brokenness in your relationship with my father so you could experience that kind of enemy love. You say, well, I wasn't, I wasn't angry at God before I met Jesus. Yeah, but were you doing with your body the things with what he designed your body to do? Were you working against his very will for what you would do with your life? And yet despite humans desire to be their own masters and even go as far as extending harm on someone else, Jesus still chose to come and give his life for you. And we realize that's where we experience the power to love enemies because it's the same power that we've experienced when we accept Christ into our lives. It's the same power now that we have because we've experienced such a great love that Jesus would give his life for us when we didn't even ask for it. And when we were still wreaking havoc in all the categories of our life, Jesus still chose to give his life for us so we could experience being friends with God. Oh Lord, how much grace I have received. Allow me and empower me to extend that grace even to my enemies. That's offensive. Because I want retaliation. I want to fight, or I'd rather at least be the victim and be bitter. And Jesus says, that's not the better way to be human. The better way to be human is in this non violent, absorbing the violence around you so you can expose the evil that's there. The best example for us would probably be Martin Luther King and his march from Selma to Montgomery. When Bloody Sunday occurred and nationally everyone realized that there was hate and racism in America because who in their right mind could violently take action on a group of humble individuals walking along a street? And then Martin Luther King, who was a pastor and a reverend, understanding of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, chose to resist nonviolently. He exposed the evil in the world. And had it not been for him, where would America be today? Now, Martin Luther King, don't get me wrong, was a special kind of man, because I don't know if I could find it in myself to do what he did. But Jesus would say to us, what he did was the better way to be human. It was to step into any conflict that we have, not run and be the victim, not stand and punch them in the face, but to absorb the evil because you have the power within yourself to do so because Christ resides in you. And you have the ability to choose to bend your will and love for even those who are your enemies, to pray for them and be kind. Why? Because let's not forget that we were once enemies of God once too, yet he still chose to give his son for us. Church, this is the thing that I believe the world is desperate to see. A movement of people stepping into the world with a nonviolent resistance and choosing to love our enemies. Let's pray. Lord, we've heard that just recently in the last couple hours, there has been talks that on the border of the Ukraine, the Russian government and the present Ukraine are gonna to get together to meet. Father, I just ask right now, Lord, with our simple little tiny church down here on our little corner of sand of Capo Beach, Lord, we ask that you would be in that room, that your spirit would move deeply in those conversations, that, that there would be a supernatural ability of laying down of arrogance and pride that no one would feel like it's too late and I might look weak or I might not look strong enough. That, Father, that there would be a sense, maybe not of you, but a sense of what harm they're doing to humans who don't desire to even be in the war. And they would make 
kingdom type decisions in that meeting, Father. And Lord, for all of us, we're not there. We're over here thousands of miles away. Father, we got enemies right here. Some of the enemies are ex-spouses. Some of our enemies are family members. Some of our enemies are co-workers. Some of our enemies is just that guy that keeps parking his car in my spot. (laughs) Father, may we choose to remember the love we received from your son and the giving of his life to reconcile us back to you. Father, may we choose to exemplify that same kind of love in every situation we have. Father, we don't have the ability to do it within ourselves. So we ask Holy Spirit, you would empower us to be that extension of the love of your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.